Welcome to the Nexus Unloaded podcast. This is Will Crozier. And I'm Zach Congonis. We are here to bring you the best solutions to your lifting problems. Through our real world experience, we hope to break things down in a digestible, applicable, and entertaining way. I just want to start out with the memening. Just the. For some background, I normally get like maybe 150 to 200 people viewing my stories. Now there's consistently over 500 people on there. Oh, that's like 50% of your audience. <laughs> you crack the, the crack the code. Yeah. Just shit memes. And the spicier they get, the better response they get. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, they, they're just sure. going to get worse. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they're pretty drama driven already. <laughs> People really like them, the tattooed muscle mummy ones. Apparently, that's mm. a very relatable point in the fitness industry at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Powerlifting in particular, probably. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, I have noticed an, a considerable uptick in the amount of memes coming out of your account, for sure. And I just wanted to say, like, it's, it's a proven tactic because I feel like... It does work. I feel like during COVID was the, the peak of the memes, but like at one point the entire fitness industry just seemingly only posted <laughs> via meme. Like we, it, not only shit talk, not only like, you know, funny shit, but like even our education was delivered via a meme. Like the meme was the, the necessary uh, medium, you know, now it's gone to like maybe a carousel or whatever, but it's, yeah, memes are powerful. It I'd like to bring the memes back. I reckon they're much more, useful at conveying a message yep yeah yeah it's been a, what have been your biggest hits honestly the biggest hit so far was the um the apu the three Oof. things they finally achieved the collared shirt a silent meat and narcissism that was <laughs> yep pretty polarizing <laughs> topic i i don't know how much more you can go before you start running into trouble and start to just look I'm going to run out of them pretty quick because currently I'm doing three rounds. I'm doing nine memes a day. Like, and they're all like three memes of the same template and then doing that three times a day with three different... I'm going to start running out of memes soon because I've already gone through in like three days. I've already posted like fucking 30 or 35 memes. At the moment, they're only story-based. Is there plans to bring it to a uh, more permanent Not really. post format? No? You can just no, keep no. With the, the blue carousels? <laughs> I think the blue carousel is nice. I think the, I think memes belong in stories. Like I'm not sc- if I'm scrolling through my feed, I'm looking for something of decent value. I'm not looking for a shit meme. But if you're on stories, you're there to waste time. So I will provide. I, I will would, provide that time waste. I think I'd like to see like maybe, them, you know, like maybe the blue slides give you the 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 education, and then the meme just hammers home. Like you can chuck it in there in the carousel. I, you know, just to well, just a fuck. A lot with of it. people do that. I a do, lot of people I, do that's that. That's what I mean. I have seen that. It keeps the engagement. Well, I want to start posting like real, like real shitty drawn dick pics or something in the middle. So you're gonna have to. <laughs> yeah. Education, education, hand drawn cock. Education, education. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a possibility. I don't know whether I'm going to go down that route. Maybe you can show me. You can start to educate me in the meme meaning. But yeah, it's... I can. I think it's it's a specific skill set because some people just can't make good memes. Yeah. Some people just don't have it. What's the formula? Like, what's a what's a what? What are the the three key values of a of a meme lord? So the three key values of a meme probably ADHD, autism, <laughs> and boredom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think oh. that's it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fair. It's like, hey, I'm gonna make a photo of a zucchini talking to a carrot about the current situation in powerlifting federations. Like, n- a normal person's not thinking of that. Mm. As people are too normal if they're trying to create good Is there a process memes. to the madness? Because I'm just trying to get an idea of it here because I've never made it one even. But I, do you have I the legitimately... idea for the meme or do you get the meme nah. template? And, okay, yeah, so you get the template you go to first. Google, go to Google Images and you just scroll through to you see some inspiration and then you just start writing. Yeah, fair. All right, cool. The... <laughs> I don't even know where we're going with this. I, I, I feel like this... This is the whole episode. Like we just need to continue to just talk describe on. memes. We could, yeah, it could be a segment. We might bring that in. So, but, but describing memes doesn't have the same impact. For I sure. feel like we had Zach's facts that were significantly missed um, <laughs> as a segment. <laughs> yeah, our segments have been non-segments. So we far. have Peter out. We segments. haven't. We haven't committed to a segment at all. 
we we bring up the idea of it, but then we don't like the idea of of yeah actually carrying you through on segments for sure. We will probably revisit it at some point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll come back. Zach's facts. All of it. I just haven't been looking at. Look, I was spending. I've been spending so much time making memes. I haven't been googling or watching <laughs> random YouTube shorts. I don't. I don't know if you remember when when we spoke about introducing Zach's facts. Um, I said on the back of like pads. They have like interesting facts that you can save, and I was I actually started yeah. saving them whenever I had my period <laughs> to bring in and like give you Zach's facts from my my period pads. Mm. And you didn't, and then, and then, then we oh, well, when we that. started we started renovating the house, and I had to I couldn't just have like period wrappers. <laughs> Say okay. <laughs> well, would the, would the, the tradies judge you? The tradies is like, why is there so many? What's going period on rappers here? down here. <laughs> um, my thing that I've got here is I, I just wanted to continue talking about my training. Some people seem to uh, be on board with it at the moment, but um, I did my first week of proper SBD. It's not like I wasn't training post comp. I just did three weeks of like uh, I call like recovery or like feel normal again weeks where I'm just um, doing. I did full, full body supersets, so like alt, alternating body parts, back to back, low rest, just moving in lots of different directions with um, not a whole lot of weight height and uh, and just the whole goal is just to feel better and, and get some enjoyment back in training, which two, three weeks, plenty, plenty achieved that. And this was my first week back doing uh, SPD variations and more of like a structured, typical uh, I guess you call it like like a hypertrophy block to some degree. Um, so I did high bar squats with like four by seven, and then usually two accessory exercises, three four sets of like your typical eight to fifteen range. Uh, you know, like split uh, split squats or whatever. And then I've actually been doing like I wouldn't call it a metcon because it's definitely not like as hard as CrossFit, but it's it's like you know the the really unfit, shitty version of a Metcon. So, like, three three exercises in a circuit, uh, one of them being, like, a, a, some sort of interval or a sprint on the bike or whatever. Um, I did some wall, wall balls, like, the, not the... not the, what What is it? Just, like, a rotational throw into the wall? Um, Just a, a general toss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a footy pass into the wall. I, I threw something um, at a wall. Because yep. I asked you about it, because I, like, I... I've found that really like like different ab work and, and core training. Um, so like different sorts of crunches and reverse crunches and like side bendy type stuff have really just, whether it's that or everything combined, whatever, it's it's helped me feel way better. Like my shoulders feel a little bit more um, just, just nicer in general from them. And training your abs is actually uh, kind of fun once you get past the initial crippling pain. But um, I was talking to you, uh, about the rotational aspect, and you said that you're a big fan of just like throws, yeah. murking something at a wall. Yeah, is, I believe the phrase that I used. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I started started fucking around with that, and I yeah ended up just like a like a footy type pass, just trying to um, mix up which leg was in front into split stance and just throwing it into the wall, and then I threw that into the little circuit with um, the sprints at the end. So. First of all, I was absolutely fucking ruined from a soreness perspective, like Dom's. I, like, I just can't believe it. Like, like it's not like I haven't been squatting. I did a whole prep. Obviously, like, low volume, singles, doubles, triples, low bar, and now I've gone to high bar, four by seven. At, and not even, RP7 was the cap, the hardest set. And I was, literally couldn't even fucking, like, walk the next day. Like, I like could unbelievable how sore I was. Um, and the one lesson that I think people can learn from this, if you're, if you're a lifter is like, don't go too hard out of the gate because <laughs> it can be a little <laughs> bit off putting for me. Like I'm pretty used to that. Like, like I'm like, Oh, you know, like being sore is part of the game. That first two weeks you get over it, but to an, somebody who's not ready for that, it is really off putting. And then for the coaches, Coaching those people who may or may not be ready and not not knowing expectations of it, like maybe starting a little lower. So maybe if I started with two or three sets and then went to three or four sets and then went onward from there, that might be a more appropriate action for somebody who is only new to it and who 
is coming out of a comp prep or something like that. That's how I would usually do it. But I was just, we decided like, fuck it, let's just jump in and uh, deal with the consequences. <laughs> and it, it actually, More of it. it fucked with my deadlift workout for sure. Like I did my squat workout on Tuesday and my deadlift workout was Friday. So it's not like I didn't have adequate rest between. And um, I was still, like, my glutes, my hamstrings, my adductors were all just absolutely fucking ruined. And uh, it really <laughs> impacted my ability to do anything on that second uh, leg day. So um, overall, I don't know whether – I'll call it a success because it was fun and I definitely got in some good work. But I'm hoping this week I'll be a little less sore, that's for sure. And the less sore you get, the more sprints you do. And you just equal it out. So you're always in a constant well, state of being beat to shit. My sprints are <laughs> pathetic at the moment. Like, um, what's your, what's your wattage? What you putting out? I don't even know. I'm not that far. Like it's, it's, I'm more based on, I'm more focused on not dying. Um, just, it's just like, like I'll do. So that one that I was talking about was just like walking lunges. I think it was like 25, 25 steps, 30 steps. Um, and then the throws up against the wall and then on the bike for, uh, I think it was a 25 second sprint and then repeat that for four rounds. And like, so you're getting a fair bit of rest between sprints, even though it's not full rest, like getting a fair bit of rest between the, the hard intense sprints. And yeah, if I was tracking wattage, it absolutely like tanked even, even with just four <laughs> rounds. So, um, yeah, something that needs to come up a long way. My heart rate and my resting heart rate and my uh, blood pressure are still probably 10 points above where I would like them to be. So, like, I'm hoping that I can use not only, like, a little bit of the difference in training, like I'm talking about, but, like, um, I'm doing low-intensity stuff on my off days as well uh, and hoping that all that can help um, bring that down in time for the next comp prep. It's like we, One thing that... I can highly recommend you trying. You should change out one of your bike sprints and just do this at the end of one of your lower body sessions. Mm. You go assault bike, 10 seconds on, 50 seconds off. Then each round you trade 10 seconds. <sighs> so then yeah. it's 20 seconds, 40, 30, 30, 40, 20. But then it's 20. not a sprint is, anymore. Is like that is not yeah, a sprint. It's just, it's just a way to fuck someone up. And I'd love to see Will film himself and nah, put it nah. on the internet. Even if I just did 10, 50, I'd still be ruined. That, that's, that's the point where I'm at. So it's not, but, uh, there's no point going harder. This is, this is what bothers me when people are like, oh, yeah, you've got to do like a 30-30 sprint. I'm like, tell me any instance. Even 400-meter sprinters are not doing the full 400-meter sprint. I saw 10 out of 10 the whole time. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Sprint, like, sprinting's a mindset. Sprinting's just fucking going ham. You can do a one-hour sprint. You just and this keep is going. exactly you why David, I'm going to demolish David you in our 100-meter sprint. RP10. RP10 for an hour. That's it. If you can't do that, you're a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Full just, Wilkins. Hey, do it. This is exactly why I'm going to demolish, go demolish Zach in our sprint off, just saying. Well, Mate, I if, I, if, I'm, if I can RP10 for 14 hours... <laughs> then, then, I, then I burnt and then carried the boats afterwards. You got nothing. <laughs> the the will bet will bet odds at the moment uh, are pretty even from what I've seen on. I've only seen Instagram, and I saw Mickey doing a little hoppy things, and I saw Zach doing his little hoppy things. And Zach was not doing hoppy things. I would I would put it in the class of hoppy things. He was bounding and not doing um... <sighs> bouncy shit. Yeah, and then and then. Yeah, so you're both looking looking pretty good at the moment. I would say pretty. Even I haven't odds. seen any sprints from Zach. Just saying. Uh, he's my ankle is. My, oh, my see, ankle this is what is I said. He's marked. already doing his like post race post. Like <laughs> I've been rehabbing my Achilles for like three months. Oh, post race post race um, reflections. I'd like uh, to thank <laughs> my rehab coach. Dave, I'd like to Dave thank Ingo David Gray <laughs> for his lower body basics program. <laughs> Mate, it's the foot and ankle. We're on the foot and ankle. Come on, give him the credit. <laughs> I, the odds are, uh, <laughs> are still even from a performance aspect, but Mickey's got the edge on shit talk at the moment. I Just, definitely do. Um, but that's only because Zach, Zach specifically said he was going to destroy me. Um, I, did, I didn't yeah. throw any shade on Zach until he said he will destroy me and try so much harder now just to beat me. Yeah, that's right. So he initiated it. But everyone's on my side anyways. 
Just it's saying. A, from your end, they are. Yeah, of course. They're not going to go, oh, hey, Mickey, by the way, you're going to get fucked up by Zach. Like, no one's messaging you that. Well, they're messaging Zach that. Yeah, exactly. Like, you're, you're, they're going to message the person. Who's, who's messaging me that? <laughs> the, the people on Zach's side are going to message Zach and the people on yours are like, you're living Jason, in your little circle. Jason and like everyone, Thomas even said it when he was on the uh, podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's hey, right. You probably, saw, said, you probably messaged, messaged Jason at the back and said, hey, look, mate, if you don't comment this, I'm going to fire you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure. He, he posted, to, he he posted it in the Discord. Anyways, we're not meant Let's to be talking on. about my, my sprints. Uh, <laughs> we'll do a full segment on later. We'll actually, like, it's a little bit closer, we'll break it the down. Great race. But for now, it's just the same stuff, which is just people, you two just, just throwing out Shame. I believe it's. Just, I believe yeah. it's just Mickey bringing it up at this point. Mickey's it is. throwing I will the shade. acknowledge that as only the judge. Because, only because Zach's trying to make every excuse under the sun so not to make it happen. All right, this is, that's the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Children, all right. Uh, we'll have a formal oh. a formal hearing closer, where where a formal we need com- more committee information. He- a hearing will be put in place where you can throw <laughs> your arguments. Um. <laughs> All right, so we are talking about today, like today, talking about bringing up or and or like biasing a single lift, or a, you know, and, and with that also comes like biasing like a, a single like body part in a way, as we'll we'll talk about. Um, this actually came in as a question through the feedback form on the website. Who who asked uh, it a, a while ago? Uh, I forget who asked. Dylan. <laughs> Dylan asked it. Yeah. Yeah. Dylan, Dylan Lang. and um. He wanted to hear us talk about bringing up an individual lift or focusing on one of the lifts in more detail and programming advice around this. Um, <clears throat> so something I think we've kind of mentioned here and there in various podcasts, definitely mentioned like the the principles behind, uh, you know, focusing on or emphasizing things, but... Um, I, I don't think we've actually talked about a single lift in like long form detail. So uh yeah, let's start off. Let's start off with I think I think the best way to start this off is like talking about why you would the various reasons on why you would do this because I think it's it's really important to uh to understand that because somebody who actually wants to do uh who's a, usually a three lift powerlifter and they get you know, they hurt their ankle, like yourself, and they go like, you know what, I'm going to do a bench-only meet um, whilst I'm rehabbing this ankle, and then after that, I'm going to go back to three lifts. That's very different from a person who decides I'm only ever going to be like a bench-only guy, and I'm, you know, I don't care in the slightest about my skinny little legs. I don't want to bring them up. I don't want to squat. I don't want to deadlift. I don't want to do anything else. I just want to, like, for the rest of my life, be the best bencher on this planet. I think they're... You have to respect that, though. Like, that pure commitment. I, yeah, fucking oath. Like, if that's your goal, that's your goal. But I'm just saying, like, there's going to be a slightly different approach for each of those people, right? Um, so, we, yeah, we need to take into consideration their long-term goal with it. Like, uh, uh, for the person who is just coming in and just doing a single lift meet because they've got a slight injury or because they, like, just want to in this comp for whatever reason, they want to go and do, like... Um, like I've done it, I've gone and hit just like deadlift comps because deadlifts is the best lift and it's just the most fun one. So we're like, why not just do that? Um, but I know I wanted to go back and hit three lifts after that. So like my prep was still definitely keeping squats and bench press in the picture to some degree, but they were de-emphasized. Whereas like a single lift person who's only ever going to do it, like um, a couple of people like Jason Semmel that I used to train for, train with at... Uh, at zero, he was Australia's best bench for uh, a fair bit of time there. He would only ever, like his his workouts would rotate between. I remember his split; it was like pressing, like chest. It was pretty much a bro split, but only the upper body stuff. It was like pecs, and then uh, like pecs, back, shoulders, arms, and then he would like start start again. They were like his four days, and um, that was off his own. <laughs> like kind of accord but then i know through talking to him in the gym like he couldn't even get under a squat bar like like to and set up for a squat let alone i didn't have the mobility in the shoulders let alone actually you know do squats 
and train his legs. Um, so, yeah, we're not going to let somebody get that far biased with things usually. That, that's a pure, like, he, he had decided, I'm only doing single lifts forever. So, like, we're never going to bias things that far, I think, from in 99% of the situations. Well, a lot of the time it comes down to time frame too. Like, if somebody's... I haven't had a lot of people, it's really only in deadlift only meets, there'll be some decent pre-planning beforehand. I've never prepped someone for a bench only who hasn't been like, oh yeah, I'm like 10 weeks out, I might do this because I've just messed my back up or something. Like, I don't think there's many people consciously planning their year around a bench only meet. So within that, there's slight limitations to how much you can actually ramp up volume and bias things in what, like a 10 to 6 week period. Mm. If you have more time, you can definitely extend that planning window out and most likely have a better outcome because of it. But depending on when they are moving into the meet, that can change things as well. Yeah, and for, for these people that have done that, how how long, like how, how much do you think this this biasing has actually helped? Like, how, like if somebody has uh, a half-decent deadlift... Like by by doing the things that we'll talk about and manipulating the program, the volume, intensity, frequency, session order, all that different stuff towards biasing towards that one lift. How much more, in your experience, do you think they've got out of that? Honestly, probably not a whole lot. Like I wouldn't say like I I couldn't put a number to it. Like my head says ten percent, but I'm not basing that on anything. And even then, I'm not even sure if it's from the fact that they've done more work towards that lift, or if they've mm. just done less work in the other lifts. Yeah, exactly. like has your deadlift gone up because you're not molesting your back with a low bar squat every week? Mm. Maybe. <laughs> like that can be just enough sometimes. And then the other side of that is like, say you have really honed down on bench press and you've, you've gone full, full spec and, um, you know, now you're benching like four times a week. You're minimizing like your low, you're taking the low bar squats out. So they're no, no longer contributing to like your shoulders being messed up and, and you're hitting like maybe a little less volume and intensity on those lifts. So like the interference from them is, is not there. All your fatigue, all of your recovery is going towards bench and you've really honed in that skill and got really good at bench pressing. Uh, and so you do get out 10%, like you said, for that meet. Do you think uh, when when I go back to three lift in the next prep and I add back in low bar squats and I back back in deadlifts and I give them uh, their their share of the, the the market again, am I going to lose a little bit of that? You know what I mean? Am I going to keep all that ten percent that I gained? Do you think it's realistic that that maybe that ten percent or more is going to be there in a three lift, or do you think maybe now with the the recovery split up again. Then I'm gonna I'm gonna lose a little bit of that because I'm not I'm I'm do, I am doing low bars again, and you know there's gonna be some fatigue in the shoulders from that. Like with like, with the extra noise, yeah. Normally they lose a, they chip off a little bit of what they hit in the single lift meet. Like if say if they made a 10 kilo PR on the bench, I think that in a lot of instances when they get to that three lift meet and they realize, ah, oh, I'm probably not gonna hit that same number. It can mess with people a bit, but generally, yeah, they do lose that little bit just because there's the extra things to contend with. Sometimes they don't, and sometimes, say, if the gains that they made were very heavily technically based, say, mm. if the increased frequency on the lift just really sharpened the blade of their skill and the skill isn't impacted as much by the fatigue, but if they just got generally stronger because their recovery was shit before, now it's better, then when the recovery goes to being shit again, they're probably going to fall into the same problems. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was actually going to say that I think uh, similar to, like you hear bodybuilders doing specialization uh, blocks or whatever. It's, it's more commonly like in their realm, like they do that. Uh, when you get to a certain point uh, as a bodybuilder, maybe, you know, not, not a beginner because everything's weak and you, and you can get pretty good gains across the board, <laughs> but like we'll maybe get to a certain point uh, where they're like, oh, my arms need to be bigger, but my my back seems to be very fine. Like it just tends to seems to seems to grow from like fuck all volume, and I I don't need a whole lot of work there. So then they will go through these like specialization blocks where they up the the volume and the uh, the amount of work that the baby the frequency with that on their arms to like a, a couple more times a week. They won't you know three hundred percent it, but it, they'll they'll definitely bump up the amount of sets per week on that body part, and then they'll pull back the sets per week on a different body part to 
try and emphasize that and to try and get more hypertrophy in that. And that's, that works. It's generally accepted. Like that you see that in bodybuilders all the time. And I think that for us, that's probably what we're manipulating more of. Cause like you said, when you, that skill is going to come up when you're doing it more frequently, just like in a normal prep, like as you get more specific as you go into comp, you do more squat bench and deadlift in your program. You do less of the other accessories and stuff like that. So the, the noise from then goes away and you're able to express the strength in the squat bench and deadlift that little bit better. Now, it's the same for the single lift. If you do more work on that, your skill is going to come up quicker and you're going to get better at that. But then when you bring in the other stuff, like you said, going to drop off a little bit again. But, I think what we're manipulating more is is that more bodybuilding aspect. Like we're putting more muscles into our pressing work, uh, sorry, more volume into our pressing work and hopefully getting a little bit more growth for prime movers for, for bench pressing this example. Like, you know, more pecs, maybe my pecs have come up, maybe my shoulders have come up, maybe my triceps have come up a little bit. And then that's where I'm going to keep the gains, like for the long term. Like you said, the more the more actual general strength you you build – through this high frequency and volume is probably the stuff that you're going to keep, whereas the skill uh, that you've got from the high frequency, other than the confidence aspect, is probably going to going to go back to normal once you introduce the three lifts again and, and prep more for a three lift. Yeah, because it's sense. not like the other lifts magically become less fatiguing. And you don't really realize no. how much they can interfere with each other until you take one out. It's actually like the crazy, time, hey. Yeah, especially if... More so for the lower body stuff. If your squat and deadlift are similar lifts, mm-hmm. if they kind of look the same, you'd be shocked how much of a difference it can make if you just take one out or just drastically re- decrease the volume. Yep. Yeah, for me, that's big. My uh, my squat and my deadlift are pretty similar. Like, if you took a photo of me from the side, I'm in a pretty similar position, like in the bottom of a squat versus my start position and my deadlift. A little bit different, obviously, but like it's pretty, it's pretty similar. And so like the 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 interference that they get on each other when I'm trying to, to push them both in a prep is is definitely significant. And when I've done those deadlift only preps, it's 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 been very obvious. And then same for the upper body, I think most people would agree when low bar squats are in the program to a decent degree, most people's bench is going to be at least a little bit impacted by that. Mm-hmm. Like uh, I I think if everybody is used to doing them together, if you take away your low bar squats um, you'll probably notice that your bench press gets a lot better. Like, uh, have you ever done that? Have you ever actually emphasized one lift or just with clients? I've, I've, I've done it for myself with, I've done it with deadlifts and I've tapered the squat right back. And that's when I think I hit the 300 kilo triple right before COVID COVIDed us. Mm-hmm. But that was purely because I just wasn't squatting at all because I couldn't be bothered putting wraps on. And Lord behold, my spine-tastic squat took a bit out of my deadlift. Who would have thunk it? Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> it, it does make quite a big difference. Yeah. And that's, that's why sometimes when I'm, uh, I actually like picture this when I'm looking at somebody like a normal three lift person, whether we're doing a single lift or not for their off season. Cause I usually, mm. uh, if they squat and their deadlift are quite similar, I'll do kind of a, a minimum effective dose type scenario for their deadlift, like just enough to the skill aspect of it. And then, all of the actual progressional work um, for those muscle groups because the prime movers are quite similar, we'll actually get a lot more through the squat. Uh, mm. Like we'll do more squatting and then we'll notice that the squat carries over to the deadlift and you only need the skill aspect, like a, enough to keep the skill in the squat, in the deadlift, sorry. Uh, and then they'll both progress, make progress from that. Uh, whereas yeah. we, we try to heat the volume on both, it, it ends up that none of them really go that far because you're just fucked all the time. And you can find some weird relationships as well. And I don't know, I don't know if this is something that you've seen, but it's like a squat's going to help a deadlift way more than a deadlift's going to help a squat. It's not saying that if you bring up the deadlift, it won't make you, like it won't add general yeah, yeah. strength, maybe make the squat a bit easier. But I find that higher squatting volumes help the deadlift more than higher deadlift volumes will help the squat. So when you are moving into these phases of you really want to bolster a deadlift, it's not like saying, cool, we just fuck the squat off and do all deadlift because there is these carryovers and interplays that come between different styles of lifts and how they can carry through to the others. Yeah, let's let's talk a bit about that, about exercise selection when you're biasing one lift because I think this is a mistake uh, or, or something that, you know, you can, maybe not a mistake, but like it's, say, say I just get rid of the squat and rid of the bench completely in a deadlift only prep. Obviously, like they're going to 
detrain and you're gonna when you go back to them later on they're gonna feel like crap uh and obviously they're not gonna make a huge amount of gains um doing next to none of them but i think there are ways where you can put like all your, all of your work or really bias the deadlift to make it as strong as it can possibly be during this this prep but still working other aspects on the squat and the bench through changing exercise variations and stuff so like if you've got like if somebody's doing a deadlift only prep, I probably, like you said, probably wouldn't do a lot of low bar squat. I probably wouldn't do any low bar squat, but I would still squat. I would still probably do uh, maybe a safety bar squat or something that's like low, a little bit less lower back intensive and a little bit more uh, biased towards their quads uh, so that it didn't impact the deadlift as much, but we could still kind of build the squat in a different way that's less impactful, You know, if you understand. Yep. And well, there's also... The fact that the recovery, so hold on, I'm trying to say, the amount of recovery that you have isn't infinite. So just because you do take all the others out, it doesn't mean you can instantly deadlift three times a week heavy. Mm-hmm. Like you're still probably limited to like in a really good case scenario, you're not doing heavy deadlifts more than twice a week. I don't care who you, unless you're like a sumo gimplet, then you can <laughs> leave. But if you, <laughs> like then you can do it as much as you want. But if you're doing like your classic kind of shit deadlift, you're not fantastic at it. It's decently strong. Like yep. you're probably not doing that more than twice a week. And if you are, you might fall into the trap of now you're overdoing it. You're pushing too much volume through the lift and there's going to be negative effects because of that. So you have to fill your training sessions with something. If you have excess volume to use and you can no longer pump it through a hinge, you may as well do the other ones. Yeah, yeah. You get some yeah, get some crossover. There's still yeah, like you can only stimulate something so much before it just you're just adding unnecessary <laughs> fatigue. You know what I mean? Like it just gets to a point where you've ticked that box, and it's like fuck anything more. Is, the ROI is gone. Uh, like the I'm spending a heap more time on this. I am my my joints are starting to get inflamed. Like the side effects start to pile up more than the benefits. So there, there definitely is a threshold for that, um, and. I think it's again. Don't want to put a number on it, like a, a like a tell everybody go out and do this percent more. But like, it's probably not as much as you think. Uh, like, I don't know if you'd agree, but like, I think if if you usually recover from doing X amount of sets of deadlift per week, and that's a good number that you've seen progress with, uh, in conjunction with your squatting and that. If you if you pull back on the squats a bit, say like thirty percent, uh, and the and the rest of the like. The, the squatting volume there and the, the variations, then you can probably bump up the deadlift like that little bit more, but it's not going to be like, I'm going to go in and just like double my, my, uh, my deadlift volume or triple my deadlift volume. Like you said, like it's, yeah, it's, it's I not don't a think you one. need to emphasize as much is what I'm saying. Like I think a lot of people think if they're doing a bench only prep, they need to do four times as much benching. Whereas you probably just need to do a little bit more. You know yeah. I mean? like, the trick is not going crazy as you ramp these volumes back up. And again, it's it comes down heavily to the length of time that you have to actually do the prep. It's saying, okay, if you have four weeks to do it, <laughs> you're not just going to add 50% more volume in four weeks because that's just stupid. It's yeah. limited by the time frame that you have, and it's still a slow increase. The easiest way to get hurt is to ramp we- to ramp workload way too fast. The way that you can think about it is if you're kind of exchanging currency, like what the Aussie dollar's kind of shit at the moment compared to the US, you can give the ticket counter man 100 bucks, but they only give you 60 back. That's kind of what you were talking about with the squats. You may trade some squatting volume, but you're not going to get instantly the same amount back for the deadlift. Yeah, yeah, and each yeah. lift has their own, like, I don't know, one's fucking Zimbabwe where one million, <laughs> one million things buys you half a loaf of bread, but that's how the exchange kind of works. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people get more fatigued by one lift than than the others for sure. So, <clears throat> really, like, uh, what I'm saying is, yeah, is like you 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 can bias things in a direction, but it's probably like it. You only need to change if this is your normal. Then you just need to like skew things in that direction. You don't need to like completely change your program to uh, like just something completely different. It's just. If, if uh, we're going to get rid of the squats, pull them back a little bit so that they're not impacting, maybe change the variation to something, like I said, that's a little less low back intensive. Uh, we're going to pull back the benching a little bit and pull back 
the although it's not as not as uh, harsh, it's, it's not as it's not the same muscle groups as the deadlift, so it probably doesn't need to be pulled back as much. But like, let's just pull that back. We've done minimum effective dose in other episodes, so like, go and listen to that if you want to know the absolute minimum you could go. But you probably don't need to go that far. And then the accessories. Uh, when I'm looking at which muscle groups I'm going to be targeting, I'm going to be targeting mainly the ones that are going to help with the deadlift. You know what I mean? So like uh, hip extension. Hip extension is the main, the prime mover in a deadlift. That's that. That's the one that I'm going to really like focus on with my hypertrophy work during these phases. Not so much that it ruins a deadlift like every other phase, but like my my accessories and the skill are both going to be pushed slightly in the direction of deadlifting in a deadlift only prep. And the same would be if you're a bench prep or a squat squat prep. Not that anyone does squat prep, but if you wanted to bias that, you could do the same thing, same process. You're just going to take a little bit away from the others to allow for more recovery to be put into that. As a general rule, it's just no sharp turns. With most training, you never take a sharp turn in one direction. As long as you follow the rule of cool, do it gradually and exchange it over time. You're probably going to get a better result than if you just fucking hung a hard right. What's that family episode where they yell, I turn now, everyone else good luck? And the drive like cuts across eight lanes of traffic? No. (laughs) I have no idea. (laughs) It it comes with an accent, but I chose not to do the accent. (laughs) So let's talk about, like we've talked mainly about volume because I I think that is the main kind of thing that you're going to manipulate when you're looking at kind of biasing or emphasizing one lift over the others. You're going to push up volume on that one that you're looking to build skill in and build muscle muscle in. And then you're going to pull back on the volume in the other lifts that are going to be less emphasized or de-emphasized for, for these blocks. Um, but what about the other, like, intensity? We do change intensity a whole lot. Like you said, you can't just deadlift, like, max out every week, but do you think you can maybe get away with a little bit more? You could definitely get away with more higher intensity work relative to where you were coming from. So say if you were breaking up your program and you had one heavy hinge day, one light hinge day, that's normally a pretty decent way of doing it. The heavier hinge day can probably be heavier and the lighter hinge day can probably be heavier relative to where they were. It's not like both of them now become heavy days. They were all just jacked up a little bit and possibly a little bit more volume to go along with that. But that's kind of how I would view it. Yeah, because usually you have squats and you have bench as your other, like they're, they're somewhere else in the week as well at a relatively high intensity, like a high enough intensity to challenge technique and to be build skill. Uh, and since they're not there, they might be there, but at, at lower intensities and, and a bit out of the way. Um, but since they're not there, you have a, you have more time between heavies with the, the deadlift. So you can just put more of your heavy attempts over a week mm. into the deadlift slot. So you, yeah, absolutely. What are your, if you're going to deadlift on a secondary day, would you just do deadlift on that second day or would you do like a, an, an RDL or a stiff leg or a deficit or, you know, a variation of deadlifts usually? For me, it would just come down to what's the rate limiter for the person. Yeah. Say if the rate limit is deadlifting technique, then they're probably going to be doing two competition style deadlifts. If the rate limiter for that person is the deadlift technique's good, but it's super fatiguing then they're probably going to do a less fatiguing variation to try and bring up whatever hole is in that lift. So say if in their normal deadlift, they shift back really hard, whatever, the shins jam back and they try to ramp it or hitch it. Mm -hmm. You can't address that very well at the heavier loads of the normal deadlift. It only happens at a certain load at the deadlift. So to work on it, you either have to work just below that threshold on a secondary day, which can be super useful, or... Pick a variation, say like a block pull is going to help keep them out over the bar or shift them back wherever you want them. So with either filling a hole or making up for a technical deficit, they're the things that are going to dictate what variations that you choose. And then, of course, what they can handle. Yeah. Like if, that's, if, yeah. That's what I was going to say as well, because I've had people where the deadlift technique is great. And so that secondary day, we're going to uh, pick a, actually, you can go both ways. Now that I think about it, I was going to say pick a variation that's going to like bring up those muscle groups more and, and just drive it. But like you could, you could argue because the technique's efficient that they could get away with more and just slam out more specific work as well. So I think it's really situational and, and more about their recovery than like there's a rule of thumb whether you do a, a secondary, like a, a variation on the, on the secondary exposure or you just keep them both specific. Um, and then there's mm. the argument for just periodization as well. So like 
further away from comp, you might do one. Like, because assuming we're not just doing one block of emphasis here, like, yeah, there's some not, lead in time. Say twelve weeks. Yeah, yeah, Give yeah, it 12. yeah. Twelve weeks. So let's say like two blocks in that time. Roughly six weeks a block per person. So that, that's about the average kind of block length. Uh, the first one might be primary deadlift, and it might be. A, you know, triples, like three to five reps somewhere in there, just like building building general strength, uh, unless they really suck at super heavy work, in which case you might just do that. Uh, and then on the second day, we're going to do like some really heavy stiff leg deadlifts or or some or deficit deadlift, like a slight variation, still close enough to the comp lift that there's going to be a significant carryover, but like a slight variation of it to emphasize a technique deficit or whatever the, yeah, you mentioned before. And then in that, Peak block, we might go like, okay, cool. Let's do both as a comp deadlift now. And just one might be really heavy and one might be a little bit lighter to just balance things through the week and, and get some exposure and some variety still. Uh, I wouldn't ever make both of them just like flat out fucking super heavy singles or, or whatever. But um, usually one will still be the heavy day and one will be a light day, but they'll both be a comp variant at that mm. kind of later stage. Um, and then you're just managing yep. overall volume and load. Like, yeah, exactly. If you, if you really break it down, what we're kind of saying there is, as long as volume and load are kind of where they need to be on both days, it probably doesn't matter which one you pick. Like, they're both going to drive it forward. If the heavy day is heavy enough and the light day is not too heavy, you're probably going to be fine. And then you've already spoken a bit on this, but you have frequency. So frequency is mm. kind of like your, uh, another variable to play around with. Typically... I would say in a when you are emphasizing or bringing up a single lift, like like you said before, you kind of have a, you have a bit more recovery to play with for that because you're de-emphasizing the other lifts, and you could typically add another frequency in through during the week. So if you're deadlifting once a week, you probably go to twice. If you're if you're benching uh, twice a week, you probably go to three. Or if you're benching th- three, you probably maybe go to four or whatever because you have a little bit more recovery room to play with. Uh, but it's not a necessity. It's yeah. not a necessity either. You can just go if you wanted to. Uh, you could just make like add in more volume to that that one or two sessions that you're already doing. Uh, that would be totally valid if you find that um, you can do that. But the problem that you'll you'll soon find out is that like if you try and do ten sets of deadlifts on one day, typically they're not all great sets. And we've talked about this in general with programming <laughs> plenty of times. But like if you try and jam in too much volume on one day. It it will get to the point where like half of those sets are just complete shit and better off just splitting them up and putting them on different days so that you're coming into them a little bit fresher and each one of those sets is of higher quality than uh than if you were to do them all at once. It's like chocolate bars. You know the amount of chocolate bars that makes your inside sad. <laughs> if it's Wait, four yeah. chocolate bars, if that's yeah. the maximum amount of Cadbury dairy milk you can eat, yeah. then don't eat five. Yeah. And you gotta split put the it fifth up. on put the fifth on up. Thursday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to miss out on chocolate because like nobody wants no. that. But because it's still like, say the expiration date's coming, you've only got a week to eat it. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't mean you eat it all on Monday. I don't know if the analogy what? works when you bring in expiration thank dates. You, and thank shit. you for that analogy, Zach. Yeah. What's wrong with that? I, oh, come on, someone actually made me a no, pickle. Was, was a pickle Last week's Rick analogy meme. was a little bit better, but yeah. P- uh, they made a pickle Rick meme. I've got to find it, and it was like pickle Rick. And had, he had muscles and shit. And he said, this is in lieu of your pickle analogy for the muscle myofibrils. There you go. No? You got to... Um, the, I, I sense memes coming to your story soon on pickles then. Oh, I've, I've, after we get off this, I have to put up me midday memes. <laughs> He's got... In his calendar. His three, it is. Three hour slot. Purely <laughs> dedicated to memes. Great. <sighs> Glad that we're uh, the paying for your meme times. It's great. Um... <laughs> The, another variable which we haven't really talked about is like session order. Uh, so usually a, a really general rule of thumb in programming is like, if you want to get good at a thing, then you do it first in your session because it's like, that's when you're most fresh and that's when you're going to be able to put in the most focus and the most effort. So if you want to bring up your arms, guess what you're going to do? You're going to do arms first in your session. Uh, that's why a lot of people have like shitty calves because they only ever do calves at the very end of their leg day because that's... Know, like an unspoken bodybuilding rule or whatever. Whereas if you actually want big cars, probably don't at the start of your workout. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, same goes with squat bench and deadlift. If you want to get really good, if you at if you're doing a deadlift, only prep, you want to get really good at deadlifting. 
obviously it's going to be first in your session, not only in that session, but on your other days. So like um, uh, a, a better one because you see it more high frequency and you can get away with high frequency is bench press. If you're bench pressing four times a week uh, in a normal program, if you're bench pressing four times a week, then there would be sessions where the squat and the, the deadlift are going to be probably ahead of that in the session and the bench might be after those because it's like a, it's just like a secondary or tertiary day for that lift um, for your benching. Whereas like if I was doing a bench only prep somebody and they were benching four times a week, they'll probably all be at the start of the session because that sounds that's awful. what I care about. Imagine opening your program up and the start of every single day is bench press. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not definitely not my, that's probably more of a nightmare for me. Uh, <laughs> but you know, it's, that's what some people want to do. But yeah, I'm just saying like, if you want to get good at something, put it at the start of the workout. Um, yeah. the, uh, All things that we were actually be teaching in our upcoming mentorship. D- <laughs> you haven't spoken Exercise. for ages and then you just jump in with that. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I'm here for. That's what I'm here for. Just keeping us on task. Yep. Just making sure things are... She kind of scared me. The... She kind of scared me, to be honest, because it came through real loud in my ears. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. When's the mentorship start? Eight, When's mentorship eight, start? Eight weeks. Starts with, the month starts with a J. I know that much. I, I get, I get, I get the, I get the J's mixed up. Nineteenth of June. Nineteenth. Oh, June. 19th that one. Of June. So is that the guys... first? Is that the first J or the second J? The first J. First, first J. J. Yeah. Nailed it. Well, January is the first J, so it's the second J. Second J. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but um, yeah, we were some time for that. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about was like how long to specialize or emphasize for. Uh, and I know I, meant, I brought this up before, you're not going to do just one block and you said two, but I would argue that that like if you want anything outside, like anything to last outside of just pure skill gains, then you're probably worth biasing it longer because like I said earlier, it's probably the hypertrophy and time that you put into the prime movers at a higher volume that is actually going to like long-term help you in, a, in an emphasis or like single lift type phase. So I would personally... If I if my bench press just sucked and I really wanted to bring it up, then uh, in comparison to my other th- other two lists, but like I still wanted to be a three lift competitor in the long term, then uh, I'd probably de-emphasize those other two and and emphasize bench press. But it would be for like at least I'm going to say like three blocks. So like if if six weeks is the average, like eighteen weeks, or whatever. I just, I just anything less, you're just not going to get a whole lot of muscle gain and it's just going to be mostly skill gain. To give an even more specific time frame to go along with that because something that really browns my beef is when people <laughs> go into a go into a specialization phase but don't actually have an objective goal that they would like to achieve. It's like, yeah, I'm working on my bench this block. It's like, oh, what do you want to get it to? Oh, I don't know, just so it doesn't suck. It's like, no, you should probably keep doing the specialization phase until you reach the objective marker that you set out at the start. And that kind of goes back to goal setting and really trying to manage those training variables, which is actually something we'll be talking about in the upcoming mentorship. However, <laughs> however, is you, this you've a got to pick a goal. competition as to who can like insert that the best? Is no. that what we're doing? Mine was here? pretty. Mine was pretty. Mine was pretty smooth. I'm not going to yeah. lie. But if you have that, if you have that goal that you're chasing towards then you can set out those time frames. And yeah, 18 weeks is probably a good time to actually start seeing progression. Yeah, I'm just giving general rule of thumb because obviously, mm. yeah, if you should be measuring metrics ideally and just going off that. <laughs> like that would that would yeah. be a way better way to do it. He's like, you know, I want my bench to come up this much or I want my pecs to grow this much or I want my arms to grow this much and then actually measure and, and manipulate uh, your, your variables to, to meet that over time and it takes as long as it takes. Um, but... Yeah, yeah, I was just more just throwing out a general rule of thumb for sure. Um, what, what not to do? What, 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 what mistakes do you see people make when they go like, "I'm going to bring up my bench press," like you said, like tracking metrics is clearly one that you just said. Um, mm. What other ones do you see people just completely screwing up with it? So this that, is an obscure. This is an obscure one, but it's just doing completely random variations for the sake of doing them, just because mm, you have the okay. volume available. It's like I want to bring up my bench. I'm going to do a single arm bamboo bar, half inch band <laughs> backwards press. It's like what? Why? Why? <laughs> like that, I don't know why it came to mind. But that's one of them. 
Yep. Just do the things that probably you've done before and might work. and That have maybe, worked for you before. Yeah. yeah, and maybe like leave the offset squat in the corner. Oh, yeah. Not an offset squat fan or? Why would you load half a barbell? <laughs> yeah. And that's yeah. coming from the dude who fucking tries to pick things up between their legs and put it on one shoulder. <laughs> like, why, like, why load half a barbell? Yeah, I, uh, uh, yeah, I, I doubt we need more. Like, I agree, though. I don't think I've ever programmed something like that. It's, rigidity is probably the... Not the other than a beginner and somebody coming into powerlifting, rigidity and stiffness through the body is probably not something that we need a whole lot more to to, to push forward for powerlifters. Most guys you know, are, yeah. are tight enough that they don't need fucking anti whatever, you know, anti rotation or lateral flexion. You, they they don't need a whole lot of that. Despite how like that seems to be the rule with core is that you do the anti stuff, but like it, we as powerlifters we do not need that. People should be moving more. With their variation. That's just a side note right there. That's a it good is. side note. I it like is, that. It's, it's, it, it's something that pisses me off a lot. Cause I, <laughs> only because I made it. Only because I did it. In the early days, I was just like, I'm just going to ab wheel all day. And then, <laughs> and then I didn't realize that. Well, it's, it's not that it didn't work because I was new to powerlifting. So I probably did bring up my ability to 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 get tight a little bit better. But um, past a certain point, yeah, if if you're if you can't rotate at all, then like what working on anti rotation is probably not the best tool. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it, you don't need any more anti. <laughs> you're already so far skewed down you that need, way. You need some of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's you, like ro- why are you trying to do that with you. everything you do? Yes. Well, exactly. it's like get a. This is, this is another shitty. I should never shitty metaphor. If you got a door <laughs> hinge that doesn't work. The door yeah. hinge is probably going to break. You don't just put more hinges. You don't put more rusted hinges on a door to make it open easier. No, nah, that's not a good one. More reps through it? I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I was, <laughs> are we, I, are we I, coming I, to the end of today's podcast? No, no, I think no, no, no. so. Uh, <laughs> 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 I, just, I just looked at the door behind me and I saw the hinges and I was like, it, that's what I'm going to say next. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Stick to stick to your man sack. We'll go with that. We have a snorting um, sack now. So I was going to say <laughs> just adding a heap of extra work on top. So if you have your SBD, like your normal kind of quite balanced uh, program, that seems to have gotten your results and you go, oh, I'm going to bring up my bench press. You need to do what we said before and take a little bit of work out of other areas, out of your squat and deadlift or whatever, and then emphasize, put a little bit more in the, in the bench press to balance it out somewhat, even though you'll never like – like you said, it's not a one for one trade, but try and do your best. Um, whereas one of the mistakes I see a lot of people is just like, I'm going to emphasize my bench press and just like slam bench press volume through the roof and not adjust the others down. And then there, it's always the toughness mentality, like, nah, I can handle it, man. And then, but but really, you're you've you've gone from like you're probably actually worse off than just having a balanced program at that point. Because now you just can't mm. recover from it at all and nothing is going to go anywhere and it, all your joints are going to be sore and it's just going to be a fucking a, a battle. You know what I mean? Like every walking in there into the sessions to even get on the bench is going to you have to do 20 minutes of warm up for each one so you can actually get in position and all that. It's just, it's it's not going to work. You're better off being uh, taken out of the other ones and just accepting the fact that that you are fatigued, that fatigue is a thing rather than trying to just mentally tough your way through it. And another thing that I find quite funny with those people who are like, bros, I just see red and increase bench volume, is if you can take your current program and pile on 40% more work and actually get progress, it means you were training like a pussy beforehand. <laughs> yeah. Like, it means that there was not enough volume in your program to begin with, if you can do that. Yeah, if that's something that you find, then maybe don't <laughs> don't go back to a balanced approach just go like okay cool I'm going to do this forever if yeah, this a, works the approach that you find um <clears throat> cool uh i think that's that's for the most part what we were going to talk do you have any anything else to add i got nothing i'm i'm fading like an old t-shirt in the sun yeah i <laughs> i think to wrap it up generally i don't think you have to have a drastically different approach because all the principles are still there. Or well, like, don't change things too fast. Don't don't add in a ton of extra volume. Remember recovery; it is a thing. You have to balance it out to some degree. Take uh, take note of those metrics. Um, 
have metrics to track on the list. Like all these things you should be doing in normal programming anyway, in a, in a more balanced approach. And you only need to skew things in the direction of the particular lift that you're looking to emphasize or particular body part that you're looking to emphasize just that little bit more. And you'll notice that that'll do a whole lot. You don't need to go like, I'm going to change to the bench only program now and just do something completely different to the, what you've ever done before. All those other rules still apply. You're still the same person. You're pushing things a little bit because you've, You'll, you'll find that you won't get any results or if you do, like you won't know why and then, and it'll just be, it just won't help long term. So that's my take on it is like, just do things like you would normally do. Adjust things, but just um, don't go overboard with it. And Everything in moderation. Red hot. And these are very <laughs> important things that will be teaching you. Did you say you. and or end? Oh, and. And, and. Yep. <laughs> no, she was like, end of podcast. It's just like, <laughs> it's just like the black screen because I've been thin. It's like, <laughs> the... yes, but, and there is a, we do have a mentorship coming up, as Mickey said, in uh, mid June. And, um, well, we kick off then. So if you'd be, if you're interested uh, in learning more about programming principles, about manipulating all these variables that we've talked about, not only in single list, but just in, in general across the board, just programming, uh, periodization, technique. Um, biomechanics uh, skill acquisition nutrition we've got a bunch of other guest got a bunch presentations of yeah, a couple of guest pres- presenters which will be coming on the podcast soon to talk about what you know an intro to what they're going to be talking about in it uh, if, if any of those things come out uh, you know pique your interest in something that you could improve on as a coach um, or as an athlete just wanting to expand their knowledge yep then uh, then hit me up uh, jump on a phone call with me uh, and I'll tell you whether it's for you or not, basically. Like, the, we all have a call with every single person that signs up. You don't have to, but, like, <laughs> why not? And, uh, and have a chat and, and, uh, and see if, it, if I can help you, basically. And, uh, and, yeah, we kick off in mid-June and for, for 12 weeks. And, yeah, reach out. And if you don't know, June is the second J. <laughs> that's, that's not part of the mentorship, but it's, it's free. We bit don't of, go through the alphabet of... and and the months of the year. Actually, hey, well, not... Zach might. Zach, I think you need, that's maybe got is you, if you go off and do a do a an alphabet mentorship for your own. Yeah, learning. like well, well, what, <laughs> January, a... March, August, February. Maybe well, a, what's like a metaphor we're talking for you about this? Go... We're actually talking about this the other day. I don't the days that have like the months of the year that have thirty or thirty one days. I never know. And then we'll... Oh, Mickey doesn't know the, the little... 30 days has September, April, June, and November. Yes, All the West have 31, except for February, which is 29. Yeah, Mickey claims that's hard If it's in remember. a song, I fucking got it. No, well, if Mickey it's in a form that, of song, I could... That's not hard. I can, what? I it's, can't it's, the song. No, because all the, the, the months are out of order. Yeah, but it's just the rhyme. It's 30 just days the have... But it's the song. 30 days 30 have, days have September, April, June, and November. All the rest have 31 except for February. See, I get, I get I like mixed up because the months <laughs> aren't in order. Like 30 days have November, I don't know, the rest of the song. But Hold like, on, what? No, no, they're no, no, all no, over no, the no, place. No, 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 no. It doesn't, it, it's the rhyme that matters. It's, it's the rhyme. Yeah, it's not the yeah, order. fuck the rhyme. Okay. Well, it's I like, think it's I, stupid. I can tell you the it's fucking, a, I can tell you the quadratic formula that I learned in year six from the song Pop Goes the Weasel. X equals negative B plus the minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. I can't tell you the last time I did calculus, okay. but I still know that. <laughs> Put that in song, I'll remember it. All right, red hot. That's another okay. thing. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Cut. Thank you for listening to Nexus Unloaded. Be sure to jump on our website to find details on everything mentioned on today's podcast, plus information on our coaching, mentoring, and gym services. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at nexusperformance.aus for any updates on what we are currently doing. See you all in the next episode.